Hello and welcome to a new edition of The Big Picture. The show where we try to go beyond the news to understand the larger forces, the larger processes that are driving events around us today. Is India in the middle of a climate change crisis? Is there climate change at all which is affecting our environment and our lives? Are we being too alarmist? Are we paying too high a price for it? What is it that India is negotiating with the international community vis-a-vis -vis our international, uh, with vis -vis our climate change commitments? What's our national policy framework? Do we have one? To discuss some of these questions and others, we have with us today a very distinguished guest, the country's leading expert on climate change. Navroz Dubash is professor at the Center for Policy Research, one of India's best research institutes. He's been working in the realm of climate change for the last 25 to 30 years. And Navroz has just edited what is arguably the most comprehensive book on climate change, India in a Warming World, Integrating Climate Change and Development. And I'll recommend all of you who are interested in environment, in climate change, in public policy, in foreign policy, should pick up this book. Thank you, Navroz, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Prashant. Very happy to be here. Do we have a climate change crisis? And how is it affecting us? Well, do we have a climate change crisis? I think certainly the science shows that climate change has been a problem that is beyond doubt. Do we have a crisis suggests that we are actually now beginning to see the effects of climate change. And I think that actually in the last five to seven years, that second question has also been answered. So the first question is the science sound, I think has been answered a while ago. The second question, are we seeing the effects? I think the answer to that also is yes. Let me give you a couple of examples. So. We've been, man we've been uh, uh, gathering temperature data for now a very long time, a, few, a couple of hundred years. The last five years is almost certainly going to be the five warmest years on record ever recorded. Let's look at ice, uh, and, and this is part of a growing trend. Let's look at the uh, Arctic ice melt, which is part of the, the, the problem that one is concerned about with climate change. If you have ice sheets melting, you have sea level rise and so on. Well. The rate of decline of the Arctic ice shields in the last decade has been three times higher than in the previous decades. So you see that the trend is actually accelerating. If you look at damages, so storm damages are 150% higher over the last two decades than they were in the de two decades prior to that. And 77% of all insurance and storm damage comes from climate related events. Closer to home, we see growing prevalence of droughts. We see evidence of declining yields. By some studies, we've already seen a decline of about 5 to 8%, depending on whether it's this rice or India. wheat. This is in India, uh, compared to the temperature conditions of the 1960s. And this will only accelerate. So we have seen, on average, about 1 degree warming already. We are almost certainly locked into 2.5 to 3 degrees warming. And these effects are going to accelerate. So yes, the climate crisis is upon us. India has to be part of the solution. But as we'll talk about in a minute, I think India also has a very conflicted role uh, in this whole discussion, something we talk about uh, in some depth uh, in the book. So are we, just to take off on that point, are we a victim of this because of policies and the development trajectory that has been adopted by countries in the West, particularly developed countries? Or are we also partly responsible for this now? So India is in a peculiar position. We are definitely victims. There's no doubt about it. We have contributed relatively little uh, to the total effects, which is, and, and you measure the effects by looking at the total stock, that is the total accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Because we have been emitting relatively little, we are responsible for relatively little of the accumulation. At the same time, because we are a large country and growing rapidly, we are likely to be a relatively large share of future emissions because some of the industrialized countries have slowed down or even reversed. So for the past, we haven't been a big part of the problem. If we are to solve the problem in the future, India is now the world's third, third largest emitter, though a long way behind India and China. If you measure on a per person basis, we are still small. But from a global point of view, what matters is less the per person basis. What matters is the total amount that goes up into the atmosphere. So India controls a substantial share, about six or 7% of what is annually put into the atmosphere. So we are in this peculiar position. We are a deeply vulnerable country because we're very poor. Our ability to adapt to the impacts is limited. At the same time, as you say, we haven't played a big role in causing the problem. 
And that is why for 20 odd years, India has negotiated from a position that said, we need the West and the industrialized countries to go first. We will do what we can. We are not denying the problem, but it is, it is far beyond our capacities to make the kinds of changes that the West requires. That has been the story for the last 20 years. But now it's actually beginning to change a little bit. Before we come to the change, you know, I just want uh, to, 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 to follow up on that and uh, go back to something that you mentioned in the introduction of your book, which is that this, is, this, this problem has led to political and pragmatic concerns within the Indian policymaking mm -hmm. establishment, mm -hmm. which is that we were not responsible for it. Uh, you guys had a good time. You fulfilled your development goals. You emitted greenhouse gases. Now, when it's our time to pursue our development goals, which requires uh, us to emit greenhouse gases in that process that will happen, you're telling us to, uh, you're trying to stop us in our tracks. Mm -hmm. So is there a trade-off involved? And if there is a trade-off involved, are we being made or pressured to make an unfair trade-off? Right. I think that's an excellent question. I think that there is certainly, over the last 20 years, there has been uncertainty about whether or not there's been a trade-off with the predominance predominant view being that there is there is indeed a trade-off. Um, so we need energy to develop. The relationship between development and livelihood and quality of life outcomes in energy is very, very clear. We need that energy. So far, the cheapest energy has been fossil fuel energy, coal, oil, gas. What has changed in the last few years is that renewable energy has become much, much cheaper and it is now competitive with coal for electric power plants uh, in India and in much of the rest of the world. So the, the trade-off may not be as stark as we had thought. Also, there is another aspect, and several colleagues in the book who talk about energy, who, talks about, who talk about urbanization, who talk about forests, bring up this point, is that there, are, there is the prevalence of what in the policy uh, jargon is called co-benefits. In other words, that there are things that bring development gains at the same time as they bring climate gains. And so for India, a new political pathway has opened. And in fact, our national action plan written in 2009 articulates this, that we can, for example, try and build cities that are more based on public transport, right? Increasingly based on electric vehicles, increasingly based on uh, um, uh, metro systems and ride sharing and so on. All of these things can make for less cluttered roads, which is a good thing from a development point of view, and can also lead to fewer emissions and very importantly, fewer emissions of local pollutants, which is what is causing air, uh, air, air pollution in, in, in much of uh, northern India and other parts of India. So air pollution as an, another crisis that India is facing, what we might do to solve air pollution is substantially aligned with what we might do to solve climate change. Not entirely, but substantially. And so there's space for these so-called co-benefits. So that changes the dynamic a little bit. So yes, while we are the victims, if it so proves that what we would do to solve climate change would also bring development gains, or put it the other way around, we focus on development that uh, improves local environmental quality, the quality of life in our cities, and if climate change is a side benefit of that, so much the better. So I think that's a very important point. You're suggesting that this is not necessarily a binary anymore, and both can go together. You can develop, and you can be environmentally responsible. Yes, you can do that if you make an effort to do so. It's not something that will happen automatically. And so part of the book says, listen, the way forward for India is to look at all of your sectors bit by bit and try and understand where the scope is for those overlaps. Are you making an effort? We are. Uh, so, so let me back up. Let me just sort of conclude on that point, though. Let me give an example of where there may not be that synergy because it's, I don't want to be uh, unduly optimistic about this. For example, moving to uh, commercial energy for low-income households. So uh, the Ujula program promotes gas use, which displaces use of biomass. Now, biomass is actually net carbon neutral because you grow a tree, you cut it, you grow another tree. Gas is actually, even though relatively clean fuel, is emitting. Nobody I know, and certainly not myself, would argue that one should therefore not use gas. So India has to make some choices. So there's a health and environment trade-off there. That's right. So and so we have well, it's a it's so so actually, health, uh, local air pollution gains uh, happen from moving to gas, uh, but there are climate costs, and there I would say we must absolutely follow what is good for our country, right? In other cases, such as public transport, they go together. So it's a slightly nuanced argument. One shouldn't take for granted uh, uh, this case. You asked whether we are actually seeking this. Now, one of the chapters in the book 
uh, by a colleague, Shibani Ghosh and myself, looks at the institutional structure. That is, how is the Indi Indian government organizing itself, but also how are cities, how are states organizing themselves? And we have now built this sprawling apparatus to try and do something about climate change, which is good news. At the same time, the coordination across that apparatus and the level of capacity and the level of uh, research and knowledge is still very much in its infancy. So part of the argument of the book is that we have to spend a lot of time thinking about how we engage this complex problem and in the context of what are multiple objectives. And that's harder than when you have a single objective because you have to look at the trade-offs across them. You know, you spoke about the national framework. Let me go back to our international uh, yes. uh, evolution on this issue. You were in Rio and you followed this process uh, for, for a long time. How, have, how has India's position evolved from Rio to Copenhagen to Paris? So it's actually been a very interesting journey. As you said, I was at, at Rio, um, I was at Copenhagen and I was at Paris and a few others uh, in between. In, in, I, I should stress that in, in the interim, I did wander off and do other things. I've not only been focused on climate change, energy, water and so on, uh, and more recently, air quality. We have a lovely collection of three papers in the book. One by Ambassador Chandrasekhar Dasgupta, who was our lead negotiator in Rio in 1992, for those who don't know. Uh, that was where the Framework Convention of Climate Change, which is the starting point uh, formally for the whole international negotiations, was negotiated. So he was our negotiator for well over a decade from Rio onwards. We have a next uh, chapter by Ambassador Sham Saran, uh, who was the Prime Minister's Special Envoy and prior to that uh, Foreign Secretary and, and so on, very distinguished uh, civil servant, um, who was our lead negotiator in Copenhagen. And then we have Mr. Ashok Lavasa, uh, who was our lead negotiator in Paris. And each of them has written their personal recollections uh, of uh, India's approach and what their thought process was. So it's fascinating uh, reading. So what I take, I, I recommend the reader to look at the chapters, but to give you the very brief version, uh, Ambassador Dasgupta writes about how during his time in 1992, the real effort was to stave off pressure by industrialized countries, by Western countries, to make this a problem that we were all commonly responsible for. And he introduced with others this idea of common but differentiated responsibility, a very important principle that has run through the negotiation process. In Copenhagen, Ambassador Saran talks about how that same principle was very much at stake. And he talks about a very interesting moment where President Obama walked into a meeting that was being held of the large developing countries, Brazil, South Africa, India, and China. And it actually led to a very heated sort of conversation and ultimately, in his view, the, the dilution of that principle, which drew us a, uh, a sharp line between the rights and responsibilities of industrialized countries and of developing countries. And then you fast forward to Paris, where there was kind of a reinterpretation of that same principle, which said, OK, we sort of agree with this dif difference, but we allow countries who want to step forward and take commitments to do so. And the notable story that was China because right before the Paris Agreement, China has said, we are willing to step forward. So you see this interesting evolution, and it puts India in a curious position, because India is a large emerging economy, but it is also the poorest of those four big countries I mentioned. So China has substantially built its infrastructure. Brazil and South Africa are much further ahead than we are. Our per-person emissions are far lower than any of those countries. But because our peer countries, in a sense, have stepped forward, at least more than they were earlier, it puts India in an awkward position. And it put uh, slightly under pressure to do so as well. Slightly under pressure, but I think what, what we have done, and, and this is something that, that we have a, a chapter on the long-term uh, negotiations by Sandeep Sen Gupta, and he explains how, while India often had good arguments, uh, this is pre-Copenhagen and pre-Paris, we would stand uh, firm by the principle, even though in practice we were actually quite, doing quite a lot. And in the last few years, I think successive yeah. governments have started claiming credit for what we have been doing uh, and, and perhaps even over-claiming, I would say, uh, credit on, on occasion. But there are some very important things that we have done and that comes through. We're in, running in, out uh, of time, Navroz, but yes. I have one final question Please. to ask you. Global multilateralism on the issue seems to be weak. U.S. has walked yes. out of Paris. Where does that leave the international effort to battle climate change? Well, brief answer, possibly. Yes. Well, it has had one fortuitous effect for India reputationally, not so great for the climate, which is that India has become a leader among laggards. We haven't actually changed very much of what we do, but by talking about it more, we are now seen as more of a leader. But that's good news for India, but it's not great news for the globe. 
And ultimately, India is a deeply vulnerable country. So if there's one criticism I have of our approach, it's that India really needs to be not satisfied by, by being relatively looking good, but actually really needs to put our collective diplomatic, diplomatic, political, and to the extent we have it, financial weight behind getting all the countries to move forward. So yes, we do need support and finance from other countries. The things that we can do in India that change our development pathway to be both uh, cleaner, uh, uh, greener, more effective with regard to local pollution and global pollution while creating more livable cities, we need to go full, for, uh, 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 full flow ahead on trying to achieve that. That's a good note to end on, Navroz. Thank you so much for joining us. Please join us for the next edition of The Big Picture next week. Thank you.